Good evening, everybody. My name is Ed Sturgeon. I'm the executive director here at the Manchester Community Library. And on behalf of MCL, I welcome you to our special hosting of the virtual First Wednesdays event, Dirty Work with AL Press. We extend our thanks to our partners at Vermont Humanities, as well as to the generous underwriters who make it possible for us to offer such rich and robust programming. The sponsor of our entire First Wednesday season is the Vermont Department of Libraries and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Tonight, we come together from across the state and maybe even from around the world to listen, to learn, to be inspired in community. Before we begin, I have a few brief housekeeping items. Uh, please be sure to uh, check in for the event. We truly value your support as we use this data for reporting on the success of the program to local, state, and national supporters of our events. The Manchester Community Library has a number of fantastic programs in the coming weeks that we'd love for you to attend, although many more can be found on our website and in the flyers available at, at the door here if you get you started. On Tuesday, October 18th at 1 o'clock, MCL is happy to host Tony April, author of The Persistence of Memory, and temporary sojourner in other South African stories, as he joins us for a creative writing workshop, Seeing Like a Detective. On Thursday, October 20th at 6.30, baseball player, sports commentator, author, public speaker, and recent Hall of Fame inductee, Jim Cott, is coming to the Manchester Community Library to enlighten and entertain our audience with episodes and experiences from his eight decade uh, baseball career. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to that as a huge baseball fan. On Friday, October 28th, since MCL calls Cemetery Avenue its home, how could we not celebrate Halloween? Come for a night of dead delicious food, creepy costumes, murder mystery party games, and haunting tunes. The party will start at 4.30 p.m. with a special tour through Factory Point Cemetery next door, led by Manchester Historical Society's curator, Sean Harrington. And of course, our next First Wednesdays event, our bottom the novel with Gloria Estela Gonzalez Centeno, is November 5th at 7 p.m. Some of you may have found the national AEP survey that's being conducted by Vermont Humanities. The survey measures the economic and social impact of arts and culture in the state of Vermont and will help us advocate for continued funding for events such as this. You can take a few minutes to fill out the paper survey and then return it to uh, Jacob at the end of the event tonight. You'll get a cool little notebook, this, and you'll also get a copy of March. So a little something for your effort on the, uh, on the survey. Or you can use the QR code that's posted on the walls and use your smartphone to fill out the survey. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Al Press grew up in Buffalo, which served as the backdrop of his first book, Absolute Convictions, from 2006. The second book, Beautiful Souls, in 2012, examined the nature of moral courage through the stories of individuals who risked their careers and sometimes their lives to defy unjust orders. A New York Times editor's choice, the book has been translated into numerous languages and selected as the common read at several universities. Tonight, Al will discuss his book, Dirty Work, published last year, a groundbreaking urgent report from the front lines of dirty work, the work that society considers essential but morally compromised. Please join me in welcoming Al Press. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, uh, and great to see people in a live audience. I know some people are joining virtually, but for me, because my book was published in the midst of the pandemic, my book tour was a virtual tour, uh, spent in small rooms staring at a screen and wondering who was out there. Um, so it's really nice to be in the presence of people, um, and I look forward to your questions and engagement with uh, the subject of my talk, which is, as was said, my most recent book, Dirty Work. Um, that phrase is a well-known colloquial expression and um, is often, uh, in, in, in popular discourse, refers to unpleasant, for the most part, physically 
dirtying jobs, things like collecting the garbage off the streets. Um, in my book, dirty work refers to something else. It, it is morally troubling activity that society depends on and tacitly condones, but generally doesn't want to hear too much about. And let me begin by uh, describing an, an example. And we have an image to go along with the example. And that is the work of Manning, or I, sh I shouldn't genderize that since it's generally women who, who do this work, but um, working on the kill floors of America's industrial slaughterhouses. And I look in my book in particular at the poultry industry because poultry is America's most popular meat um, and because what goes on in industrial poultry plants is so hidden from the consumers of chicken, the consumers of poultry. I know this may be a little bit different in Vermont because I learned earlier today that a lot of people here get their meat and poultry from local farmers. Um, in that sense, you are very much an exception and, and a healthy exception to the rule, I would say. Um, now, disturbing conditions in, in meat packing and in poultry plants are nothing new in the United States. And in my book, I talk about the great book written, published in 1906, by Upton Sinclair, uh, the leading muckraker of his era, called The Jungle, which is still, I think, read and assigned in some high schools. And um, when Sinclair wrote that book, most of the meatpacking, the stockyards and the meatpacking plants in the United States were located in big cities like Chicago. In fact, that's where he did his sort of field research. And although The Jungle is a novel, it is a novel that's kind of steeped in journalism. It is based on what he saw and, and, and observed of the workers in the actual stockyards in Chicago. And in that time, 100 years ago, the workforce in these, in these stockyards was mostly immigrants, uh, overwhelmingly immigrant labor, uh, labor that uh, native-born Americans uh, considered beneath them, didn't really want to do, and Sinclair makes vividly clear in the jungle why that would be. He describes workers who are denied, um, who, who get injured on the job and therefore have to uh, leave and, and lose their livelihoods. Um, he describes workers being denied basic amenities, the heat during winter, access to toilets. Um, this book really was a shock to the conscience of America at the time that it was published. Although to Sinclair's great disappointment, it led more to reforms that had to do with making meat more diet, diet, cleaner conditions so that the meat would not be unsanitary, unsanitary rather than to better conditions for the workers. This greatly disappointed him. He said at one point, you know, I aimed for people's consciences, but I hit them in the gut. I hit them in the belly. Um, and I'll get back to that theme because I, I think it's, it's not so different from what we have today. But as I say in my book, um, in, the, in the decades that followed, especially after World War II, conditions in America's meat and poultry plants improved. Uh, this was always and maybe is inherently a dirty, unpleasant job when we think about just being amidst the processing of animals, the, the, the blood, the guts, the, the sort of, again, the physical dirtiness of that. But average wages in meatpacking were actually higher than in most factory jobs in the United States for in, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, many plants had integrated workforces, black and white workers working alongside each other. Many plants were unionized, and workers could and did speak up when their rights were violated. And this was not by accident. This was because unions fought very hard to improve conditions. A hundred years later, we are back to the jungle. Um, we are back to a situation where the working conditions in most industrial slaughterhouses are as degrading and dangerous and unconscionable as they were when Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle. The key difference 
is that the conditions are now more hidden because the plants no longer exist in large American cities. They exist in very remote rural areas. Uh, and there are all kinds of laws that make it very difficult to document what goes on inside poultry plants. Um, I traveled to two states to report on the experiences of, of uh, workers in the poultry industry. In one of those states, I had an in, I thought, and I was told the workers would be willing to talk with me. Um, I spent a week there, and it turned out none of them were willing. And uh, they weren't even willing to discuss, to talk about their working conditions anonymously. That is, without their names. No, no attribution, even if I change details. The reason for this was that a uh, meatpacking plant had recently been raided in Tennessee during the Trump era. And it wasn't raided by the office, but by OSHA to make sure that the workers had safe conditions. It was raided by ICE to deport the people who worked in the plant. Over 100 workers were deported in that raid. And this is, again, not by accident. The restructuring of the meat industry took place, began in the 70s, and then accelerated in the decades after that. And, and it was the pursuit of what one uh, scholar has called the low-wage strategy. Get out of the big cities where the big unions existed, relocate to more remote areas, and hire a more docile workforce. And that workforce consists overwhelmingly, once again, of immigrants and undocumented people. And that first plant that I visited, none of them, as I said, would, would tell their stories to me. But I went to a second plant, one in Texas, um, and not far from Texas A&M University, and there, a plant owned and operated by Sanderson Farms, one of the uh, largest poultry producers in the country. Uh, the workers there were willing to talk to me. And what did they describe? Uh, they described conditions eerily reminiscent of the jungle, being denied freedom of association, being uh, denied workers' compensation when they were injured. I interviewed several workers who felt that when, once they started suffering repetitive strain injuries, uh, injuries to their wrists, injuries to their shoulders, they were discarded, just like the remains of what wasn't put in for, for sale uh, to consumers. Um, and because they were damaged goods, they were no longer of use. Um, they also described being denied bathroom breaks. And uh, this was particularly painful and humiliating to the women who worked in this plant who took to wearing sanitary napkins or an extra pair of pants to work because they were given a 30 minute lunch break. But during that lunch break, everybody went to the bathroom. And if you needed to go later, and it was too crowded at that time, you would get yelled at by your supervisor, by the people who, who aren't in this image right here, but who are standing over the workers. And why not give these workers bathroom breaks? Why? Um, because the lines are run faster and faster to meet the production quotas set by the companies, to satisfy consumers who want this chicken produced and processed cheaply, in abundance, and although the labels on some of the chicken do tell you how the animals were treated, they almost never tell you how the workers were treated. By the way, the company that owned this plant in Texas that I visited was, at the time that I visited it, um, running a public relations campaign. And the title of that campaign was Missions in Transparency. The idea being, consumers need to know more about the wonderful conditions that the products they're buying are, are uh, made under, because that will make them all the more eager to buy chicken produced by our company. Well, 
I tried to call the company running the Missions of Transparency campaign to enter the plant, to just take a look around, to talk to some workers. And as I report in the book, I was denied access to the plant. In fact, I found it easier in this book and in, in the course of reporting dirty work to enter military drone bases, which do work that, are, that is officially classified, than I did to enter chicken plants that produce so much of the food that ends up in fast food restaurants. Um, and that tells you something about just how transparent they, the company's actually, the industry actually wants the conditions to be. Um, now, there are three features of dirty work that um, are common throughout the book and that, that transcend the particular examples because uh, I look at, at four or five different industries in the book, but that are common themes and that really relate to the nature of this work. The first feature is, as I said, that this work is hidden and remote. Um, it is not work that the people overseeing it and profiting from it want the general public, want the consumers uh, to see. A second very important feature of this work is that it is allocated to less privileged members of our society to go back to who does this kind of labor in the United States today. It's not the sons and daughters of senators. It is not graduates of Ivy League universities. It is undocumented people, people with fewer choices and opportunities, workers who can be more easily controlled and who are expected to endure these conditions uh, in silence because they are afraid. Uh, there's a quote in my book at the very beginning from James Baldwin um, who says, uh, the powerful uh, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up the quote. The, 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 the powerless, the powerful can have their dirty work done for them. I'm sorry. I, I, let me, I'll get back to that quote. Anyway, um, it's a quote that basically says those with power can have dirty work done for them. The powerless must do it on their own. And, um, and that's the theme of the book. That this, book, that this kind of work is not randomly distributed to all different classes and all sectors of society. It is disproportionately allocated to people who have the least opportunities and choices. And that, in turn, perpetuates it. It makes it easier for more privileged people to kind of ignore it, knowing someone else is doing that work. The third theme that is common is that this is labor that injures and harms the people who do it. Now, it also causes other social harms. And if anyone here has read the work of Michael Pollan or various uh, other writers who have written about the industrial food system, you know that it is, uh, there are hidden environmental costs, enormous hidden environmental costs, that have to do with the way we produce meat in this country. Um, there are obvious ethical questions surrounding the treatment of animals that you know, lead again to those labels on the packages, some of which now say humanely treated. I'm not so sure those labels are accurate, but at least they speak to a concern about that. Um, but beyond those harms, there are harms, I think, to the actual workers who are allocated these tasks. And in my reporting in Texas, I talked a little bit about meeting workers who had suffered physical injuries. And this has been reported to some extent in the media, and especially during the pandemic, there was actually quite a bit of reporting on the meatpacking industry, which talked about how crowded the plants are, how workers were getting sick because they were breathing contaminated air and not given access to PPE, and how the speed of those lines creates physical strains, right? Wrist injuries, uh, hand injuries, shoulder injuries. But those were not the injuries that the workers I talked to and met talked about the most. 
the, the deepest injuries they had suffered were emotional wounds. The assault and degradation of, of their personhood, of their dignity, of their sense of, you know, self-respect, going to work and having to figure out how to go to the bathroom because you will be yelled at if you ask to go to the bathroom, fearing that if you ask, you may get fired. And if you get fired, you may get deported. Um, that sense of precarity and that sense of feeling expendable was not just about the physical injuries. It was about these emotional wounds. And I, I talk in the book uh, about a book called The Hidden Injuries of Class, which was published more than 20 years ago. Uh, and written by, uh, co-written by two sociologists, Richard Sennett was one of them. And these hidden injuries are things like shame and stigma and feeling degraded, feeling devalued. When we talk about inequality in this country, we don't tend to talk about those things because they are very difficult to quantify. What we talk about is wages. Uh, is, is income, you know, is, is purchasing power. And, and those things are very important. And, you know, you have to make a livelihood. How much you get paid for your job is enormously important to all of us. Um, but there's another dimension of inequality that we don't talk about enough, and that is moral inequality. Who ends up having to work on the kill floors, having to see these conditions? having to absorb the smells that if you just once go to an industrial slaughterhouse, you will not forget. Um, and I think that those, that's why the book is subtitled um, The Hidden Toll of Inequality. Um, because I think there is a hidden dimension of inequality that even though we, we've talked a lot in the last 10 years about how unequal a society the United States has become, we don't talk about it in these terms. I think that that's, you know, the next step in some ways for, for those who, who think about, you know, how to make society more equitable. Um, I'm going to show you a slide of another worker in the book. Uh, this is one of, this is an image I wish I could have included in the book. Unfortunately, we didn't put photographs and illustrations in it. But this is a painting, um, and it's a painting of a guy named Stephen Stone. And Stephen is, or was rather, um, a rigger. He worked on an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. And the painting was done by his then wife, Sarah. Um, and she painted this portrait of Stephen shortly after he and some of his co-workers appeared in Washington at a hearing because of the disaster that had taken place on the rig he worked on. And some of you may, by virtue of this, know which rig I'm talking about. Stephen worked on the Deepwater Horizon rig, which exploded in 2011, killing um, 11 workers who were on the rig at the time, injuring dozens of others, um, befouling the coastline throughout the Gulf, causing massive damage to fishing industry, to wildlife. Um, why did Sarah paint these paintings? She sat at that hearing and listened and watched as senators and representatives held up images of the harm that this spill had caused and the damage it had done. And what, what were those images? They were images of dolphins. They were images of pelicans. There were no images of workers. The workers on the rig were not mentioned. And here they were at a hearing in which the widows of those workers were sitting in the audience. And although Sarah herself was not a widow, 
Stephen survived this blast, as I document and, and describe in the book, his spirit was shattered by what had happened. Um, he was not the same person. He was not this jovial, fun, life of the party kind of guy. And you can see that. It's, it's very powerfully captured here. Um, a somberness, um, a disappointment, a sense that he had been lied to. He felt so lied to by this industry that had hired him. He, was, he had been in the Navy, and like a lot of former Navy guys, when he came back to his town, and the town he was from in Alabama, he had a choice of working at the local rug factory where a lot of the people he knew in town worked, um, or of making a little more money, quite a bit more money, by working on a rig. And he chose to do the rig job, and of course he assumed, you know, this is the United States, this is the oil industry, they've got all this money. The safety standards have to be, you know, absolutely top, right? They're not going to just let things go. Then the explosion happens, and Stephen, who, by the way, uh, would take, each time he went on the rig, he would take a bunch of books, and he also took a journal in which he wrote poetry. Um, I don't think he finished high school, but um, I've rarely interviewed a more intelligent uh, person. And Stephen read about the actual safety standards on um, the Deepwater Horizon and other rigs afterwards, and he felt this crushing sense of disillusionment and betrayal. And I say betrayal because a central theme in my book is a particular kind of wound called moral injury. And I don't know if anyone has heard that term in the audience tonight, but moral injury is uh, a term that was first coined by Jonathan Shea, a psychologist who, who writes about military veterans. And in a book about Vietnam veterans, he talked about how a lot of these veterans, what, what troubled them most was not PTSD. It was not sort of this fear of a traumatic, uh, you know, life-threatening explosion or situation that, that may have cost one of their uh, you know, brothers their lives or, or leads to flashbacks in which their own lives were unsafe, but rather a sense of moral betrayal, that they had been betrayed by their commanders who told them a story about why they were fighting and what they were fighting for that turned out to be a lie. And dealing with that sense of betrayal, he, he suggests, causes this wound Moral, uh, moral injury. And in more recent years, that term has been expanded to talk about people who went to Iraq and Afghanistan and saw and participated and did things that went against their own core values and created a, this kind of wound to the soul, this hidden injury, again, to, to go to that theme. Um, and what I'm suggesting in Dirty Work is that the conversation we've had about moral injury with military veterans should not be limited to them. Because it was clear to me that Stephen felt this, um, and that the other dirty workers who I wrote about felt this sense of moral injury for one reason or another. Um, and by the way, when I, when I visited Stephen and, and Sarah, and they told me about that hearing, I'll never forget, Sarah said, she was describing how these senators were holding up the pictures of the pelicans, and no one seemed to remember that, that there were workers who had also been hurt. Um, she said, you know, it's just weird. It's weird. And Stephen said, he didn't think it was weird. I said, well, why don't you think it was weird? He said, well, you know, people see the environment as innocent, whereas we just being in that industry, you know, you kind of brought it on yourself. And I think he gets at something so profound there, which is why I called this book Dirty Work. It's that part of the wound is this feeling like you're the one to blame. You know, look at you. You, you went and worked on a rig. This is, this is an industry that's, you know, just causing climate change, causing global warming. And, of course, it is causing those things. Um, 
but the question that we should ask is, okay, why do we look at the workers as degraded and, and you know, you kind of brought it on yourself, and not the people pumping gas into their vehicles, not the whole society that has that caters that this industry caters to, right? This dialectic between the people who work in these industries and the broader society that, as I said, depends on or tacitly condones what's going on because it's part of our lifestyle. It's the food we eat. It's the kind of fossil fuels we've been accustomed to burning. Um, or in other cases, because of policies and laws that have come about and, and social transformations. Um, there's a section of my book about people who work in prisons and particularly in the mental health units of prisons. And as I write in the book and show, in those units, it's very hard for a nurse or a psychiatric aide to follow the Hippocratic Oath. Go try. Go try to do that in a underfunded prison in Florida where there's two guards for every hundred prisoners they're working for, you know, eighteen, twenty thousand dollars a year. There are no rehabilitative programs. And furthermore, the jails and prisons of Florida have become the largest mental health institutions in the state. They have become, they have replaced the hospitals that were shut down because people were outraged at the inhumane conditions in the hospitals and state psychiatric hospitals. But what did we do? to replace those hospitals. We didn't follow John Kennedy's vision of creating community mental health centers where people could go, particularly poor people could go, uh, if they had mental health problems. We basically left the dirty work to jails and prisons and to not just the nurses and psychiatric aides that work in them, but also to the guards. Uh, and I interview some guards in, in the book um, who have no training dealing with people with mental health issues, and what do we expect will happen as a consequence of all of that? Are we surprised that there's abuse? Are we surprised that people are thrown into solitary confinement that make them only sicker? Are we surprised that um, you know, guys leave after you know, cycling through these institutions come right back out and once again are picked up for panhandling or for, for some other incident, we, we shouldn't be surprised um, because it's so predictable. It's so clear that the, the responsibility for this goes beyond just the workers. And, and unfortunately, when, and I, I write extensively about one particular prison in Florida where the, the abuses were so shocking uh, they eventually were reported on in the Miami Herald. And the reaction was, well, let's fire those guards. Those guards, you know, they're, 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 they're brutal. They, they, look what they did. There were, you know, little mug shots in the paper. By all means, those guards were doing brutal things. I don't in any way paper over that, don't deny it, don't think that we should absolve them of responsibility for what they did. But what about the governor of Florida, Rick Scott, now a senator, by the way, who oversaw a prison system that was the third largest prison system in the United States, and that, as one of the guards uh, I interviewed, a guy named Bill Curtis, said, you know, the citizens of Florida, they got what they paid for. They got exactly what they paid for. Florida, by the way, a state that only Idaho spent less money on mental health services than Florida. Um, so again, it's the, the point of the book is, is twofold. It's both to give people like Stephen, the workers that I met in that poultry plant, the mental health aides that I met in the prison, it's both to give them an opportunity to tell their stories, and it is a book of stories, but it's also an attempt to broaden the circle of responsibility, to make readers think a little harder about how all of us may be implicated in this work. And I know that is a, a very dispiriting thought.
thought and you know during the pandemic and especially right now um, it's we, we don't we don't want to feel dispirited because it's been so hard you know people have been isolated from each other uh, we look at the world and we see a war in Ukraine we see in this country mass shootings that seem to happen every other week if not every other day um, we see a political system that seems to be cracking up um, with political scientists talking about the possibility of civil war. Um, so nobody really wants to hear it right now, and, and I get that. Um, but I also think that if we don't talk about these workers, if we don't think about how our own lives are connected to their lives, um, it will just go on. And I think one positive thing that did happen during the pandemic is that it, it really pulled back the curtain on the division of labor in our society. I mean, I, if you go back to my title page here, essential jobs and the hidden toll of inequality in America. Well, we learned very quickly after the pandemic began that there were essential jobs and non-essential jobs. Yeah. And the non-essential jobs tended to be done by more privileged people, frankly, people like me, um, sitting at their computers, not risking their lives, not risking their health, not having to go uh, out on the street when there, were, there was this fear that, you know, at any moment you could get infected. Um, and, but, but we couldn't just sit there at our desks and our computers and without packages being delivered to us that brought us our food. And without, you know, um, someone driving the bus and someone driving the trucks and someone, you know, putting the groceries in the bags and someone in the warehouse at Amazon placing things in, in, in you know, shipping containers. So it shed this real spotlight on this class division because we know it wasn't just a division of words, essential and non-essential. It was also a class and a race uh, a division where, again, the more privileged had the luxury not to have to go out and fetch their own groceries. And the essential workers had to put their health and safety on the line, including in meatpacking plants, including in Amazon warehouses. Um, I think that's a good thing that we all started thinking about this. And I started researching this book long before the pandemic. Um, and when the pandemic began, I, I thought, you know, I, I had a lot of work to do to sort of integrate what was going on, and it just, it just struck me that this is an, an opportunity, that as a society we have an opportunity to actually think about our relationship to, not just to give lip service to essential workers, but to actually think about what, how they should be treated and whether their dignity matters to us, which is something, of course, I won't forget you know, Biden saying at the, when he accepted the nomination, he told a story about his father and he said, you know, his father told him, Joey, a job is not just about uh, a salary. It's about your dignity. It's about your place in the community. Well, you know, these, uh, these people also deserve dignity. You know? And you can see in their faces, this is Harriet Kriskowski, me mental health counselor I write about in the book. Just look, at, look in her eyes and see what, it, it, it tells a story that I, yeah, I don't have time to go into right now, but you can see the wound. You can see what she went through. Um, here is, that's the Dade Correctional Institution, by the way, the, the prison where she worked. Um, that's the quote, <coughs> finally. <laughs> the powerless must do their own dirty work. The powerful have it done for them. And of course, when you try to paraphrase Baldwin, you're, you're running into trouble, so I'd rather just quote him. Um, and here's another uh, worker I wrote about. This guy, Chris Aaron, worked in the military as a drone operator. And just, you know, again, you see, you see a sort of theme here. Look at his expression. Look at Harriet's expression. Look at Stephen's expression. Um, so, just before questions, um, I'll say one more hopeful thing, which is that dirty work is not etched in stone. I started out talking about meatpacking and how the conditions had changed. 
These conditions are not immutable. They become what they become because of political, social, economic forces pushing, because of power tussles and, and, and values and choices we make as a society. But these things can change. And I am, to the extent I'm hopeful, I will say that I wrote in the book about a meat, uh, a food system, an industrial food system, that in the last 20 years, a lot of Americans have really become aware of. And you know, a lot of, a lot of people do want to look at those labels. They want to know. They want a sense of a clean conscience when they're purchasing you know, a, 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 something that they're going to serve to their children and put on the dinner plate. Um, that wasn't true in, you know, before Michael Pollan was writing, before there was this movement to kind of reform the, the food system. Same with the prison system. Um, the ter- I, when I started as a journalist, mass incarceration was not on the map. Nobody talked about it. Um, it. The only thing people talked about was being perceived as soft on crime. You know, if you were perceived as soft on crime, whether you were a Democrat or a Republican, you couldn't get elected. And note that in the 2020 presidential election, one of the things that Donald Trump attacked Joe Biden for doing was signing the crime bill when Bill Clinton was president because it put too many people in prison. That tells you something about how much has changed. Because here he is, and Trump is not exactly, uh, I would say, known for his leniency towards uh, people suspected of crime. Uh, And yet he's attacking a Democrat for being too tough on crime. Um, so these things do change. The oil industry and the climate, you know, there's a, there's a generation, and I spoke to some young people today here in this state. Young people are really scared. They're worried. They're angry. Why has my, my generation, older generation, why have we failed them? Why have we let this go on? Um, so these things can change, and dirty work can change. And I'll end on that note and welcome your questions. Yes. So, is there a call to action to help um, um, the people that you're just talking about? Um, is there pending legislation? Are there organizations um, that um, are set up to um, to help safeguard um, the issues that they're confronted with? It's a great question. Um, the reason I was able to talk to the poultry workers in Texas is that there was an organization in that little town um, with Spanish-speaking staff that run out of a church. And its purpose was to educate the workers that they have rights, that labor law actually applies to them in this country, and that there are laws. So if you get injured on the job, you can't just be fired and, and, and thrown, you know, treated like, like, like a broken piece of machinery. Um, now, it's a shoestring budget that that small organization runs on. It is, as they would be the first to say, it's not a substitute for a powerful industrial union of the kind that you know, really fought for better conditions two generations ago. Um, so is it enough? No. Um, but it is something. I, I also think, and this is another encouraging thing I see, um, the extraordinary shift in uh, perceptions of labor unions in this country, particularly among people in their 30s and 20s, uh, who work at Starbucks or who work at Amazon or who work at, you know, what have you, you know, marijuana dispensaries. Um, There are all kinds of organizing drives going on that no one thought would happen uh, because this was the service industry. You can't organize the service industry. They're just, you know, they're expendable. They're going to be replaced. So I don't know that there is, but I think that um, it's a question of what is arising. And I think there is a general, uh, my perception is that um, this is all up for grabs right now. That, you know, thanks to Occupy Wall Street, thanks to Bernie Sanders, thanks to, um, uh, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, developments over the last decade, there's much more consciousness of inequality. There's much more consciousness of 
the fact that workers in this country are denied basic rights that in other countries are assumed. I mean, things like sick leave, you know, talk about being important with the pandemic. You know, one of the first things I read when the pandemic began was a report on how backwards America's, uh, you know, paid sick leave policies are compared to other countries. And, you know, that's going to continue to be relevant. So I think it's changing, um, but it's a long struggle. I have a question from uh, the internet. <laughs> yes. Um, someone wanted to ask about the relationship between the work of disaster relief, like what's happening now in Florida, and the often undocumented carpenters and laborers who will ultimately rebuild that state, most likely with little recognition. That's a great question. I should write an article about that. Um, <laughs> I, I should tell the, the, whoever asked that question. Um, as I was researching the Deepwater Horizon, um, one of the things I learned was about the uh, similar types of workers who were hired to do the cleanup, who were hired to go to the coast and basically mop up the mess of BP and you know these billionaire, billion dollar companies um, that had befouled the coast. And um, it was such a, it is something that, that I, I would like to write about. I haven't done so. But, um, you know, my sense is that, uh, yeah, there's a lot of um, exploitation and, um, you know, injustice that goes on when these disasters happen. It's not something I've, I've reported on firsthand. Yes? We have the same, similar issue in this country. Couple generations ago, my father actually wrote quite a bit about it. And, um, these were the factories in Massachusetts with children coming. And, you know, we were able as a country to create labor laws that would have stopped for that. They were treated much the same way. And of course, the powerful felt like, you know, well, that's just their lot in life. And I worked hard to get where I am. So, um, and it's sort of like the history keeps repeating itself. So, but we lived in Sanford, North Carolina, where there was a Tyson plant. And we, um, my husband and I, uh, shared a program down there um, which housed homeless families in churches. <laughs> and it's called... Interface Hospitality. Interface Hospitality, <clears throat> where you get eight or so churches in a community which have kitchens and bathrooms and are only used on Sundays and Wednesday nights. And, um, but it was a, a program where a family would come in and they had, they had, I think, nine weeks to get themselves together, to get, get their GED if they didn't have it, and get a job. And most of them, of course, were moms with little kids. That family. And of course, guess where many of the moms found their work? Tyson's chicken. And I don't think I could stand here and walk in and smell it. And, but, you know, there was, as you said, there was, they didn't feel proud that they were finally supporting their children in Kevin Park, that state funded park. But the, the, the moral part, I really, I really feel touched by that. Well, I think that that's actually, thank you for reminding me about that. It's a great story. And, and I think that when, it, when the question is, are there advocates for these workers? I think there's an added challenge here, which is the judgment that they know the better people in society have. Oh, you work in a, in a meat factory? Ugh. You know, you work in a prison? You're just a functionary for, for the, this horrible prison system? You work on an oil rig? That judgment is so easy to make from the outside. And again, I'm not saying that the folks who work in these industries are, are innocent. Um, in, in each of the chapters that I look in, you know, they themselves talk about feeling they've dirtied their hands, so to speak. You know, Stephen, um, when he, after the deep water explosion, uh, he visited an island where he used to go with his, his family when he was a kid 
for summer vacation. It was having beautiful white beaches. And the beach was completely black. And he said, you know, I, I felt like I, I had done that. You know, we had done that. Um, so it's not that he's saying, I'm innocent, don't judge me. But then he said, you know, but what about all the people who, like, get their SUV and, like, put oil in it and, and get, you know, and fill it up and, and don't even think about it, right? And that's what's so disturbing. And if you read my book, you'll get a sense that I draw this concept of dirty work from a, a sociologist named Everett Hughes. And the essay I talk about, it's right in the beginning of the book, is an essay called Good People and Dirty Work. Good People and Dirty Work. And Hughes wrote this essay after visiting Nazi Germany, except it was post-war Germany. And he hadn't gone there during the war, but he had been there, he was a, he was a sociologist at the University of Chicago. He had been there before Hitler came to power. And who did he know? He knew professors and architects and writers and journalists. He knew the good people. So he wanted to ask them, well, you know, what do you make of what just happened here? You know? Um, and what he first noticed was just this conspicuous silence. Nobody wanted to talk about it. It's, you know, 1948. It's all fresh. Everybody feels creeped out. But he goes to one of these, one of the houses of one of these good people one night. It's an architect's house. And the architect tells him, well, you know, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed for my people whenever anyone mentions this. But, you know, the Jews, they really were a problem. And he, they were taking all the good jobs. I mean, they were gathering in these filthy ghettos. And, and Hughes sort of writes this all down. And then he writes this essay, good, good People and Dirty Work. And what he suggests is that there was an ambivalence here among the good people. It's not that they liked what the Nazis were doing. It's not that they approved of it. But it's that they kind of put it out of mind because it was being done by someone else over there. We didn't have to look at it. That problem was being taken care of. Now, of course, that's an extreme example. But Hughes, being a sociologist, is interested in societies in general. And he's American. And he said very explicitly in his letters, which I quote in the book, that he wrote that essay with his own country in mind. What kind of dirty work do we not think about, because it's going on over there, and somebody else is doing it. So I don't have to think about it, because I'm not implicated in it. That's the point of the essay, and that's the point of departure for my book. I, I'm having, I've been having trouble trying to figure out how to talk to you, because for me, everything you're describing Everything you're describing is a classic abusive move, move, move to take towards a being, a being, a woman, a child, a dog, a cat, any, a fly, whatever the being is, and to get power over the being, the first thing you need to do if you believe they're conscious is to get them to think less of themselves so they can't have boundaries, right? Now, the boundaries are really important because they express your rights as an individual, whether it's being able to go to a bathroom, being able to have time to eat, being able to smile at a coworker because you're just not doing boo Whatever it is, the sense of a person's boundaries gets to crumble and they're turned into like a blob basically that they have feelings, they care and maybe they're really good to their children trying to help them get out of this thing by putting them in a new school or something but they what you're talking about, everything you're talking about is that classic abuse and the last thing you mentioned and Ken Wilber talked about this is that there are people who don't really care about England and then the people that maybe care about one or two people, maybe a family member, or maybe the sorority or some golf club. They don't care about anybody else. And, and, and then 
people get even further, like maybe they care, but they don't really care, you know? So it's only when we really decide to step up as a group and really value other people's boundaries. I mean, there are other countries that are doing it with different things. I mean, Finland with education and, and you know, Michael Moore did a whole movie about it with the flag, you know, because he, he showed it how each different country respected the rights of people in a certain way, you know? And, and our country is like a culture of money. There is no culture for really caring about our neighbors unless it happens in the towns in isolated pockets. I mean, Vermont, I think, is very special. There's a lot of work here. Well, let, 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 let me, if I may. Um, I, you know, there's a story I haven't told, uh, but I think it's a good one to, to end on if we're, if we're sort of running well on time. Uh, that, that speaks to an alternative. Uh, I mentioned this moral injury, this idea uh, that, that people suffer these wounds. Um, they, suffer, they tend to suffer them just, just like PTSD, um, individually, alone. If they talk to anyone about it, it might be a, you know, a VA psychologist, or, you know, close friend, but it's all sort of hidden, right? It's all, nobody talks about it. Well, in one scene in the book, when I was writing a section on the military drone operators, um, I decided to go to a VA uh, hospital in Philadelphia that takes this idea and tries to turn it on its head. And what they did is they brought veterans together to talk about moral injury. And then they, after seven or eight weeks of working with those guys, they had they invited members of the community to a ceremony. And I attended this ceremony. It took place in this VA hospital. And the veterans got up and talked about what they had done at war. You know, they, they had served in Iraq, they had served in Afghanistan. One guy named Andy, in particular, gave an absolutely shattering presentation about how he had grown up in a, an abusive family he had watched his siblings um, get physically abused, and he wanted to protect the weak. He, he made it his mission to protect the weak and defenseless. And after 9-11, he rushed to join the military, thinking, believing that he was going there on a moral mission to Iraq to liberate the people there from Saddam Hussein. And one night he's there, and he calls in an airstrike on what he thinks is uh, an enemy uh, battalion, or uh, sorry, enemies who are, who are in a building. And when the smoke clears, he sees there are no soldiers there, there are no enemies there. There are 23 civilians there. And he gives this presentation. He's sobbing as he does this. And then the chaplain who ran this uh, service called the members of the audience forward and asked them to surround the veterans. And in unison, to, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to get the exact words, but basically to recite uh, a series of uh, uh, statements about how we sent you there and we share responsibility for what you did. And it was an incredible experience to see, and it's the very thing we don't do in this society. What we don't do with dirty work is those connections, those confrontations, asking the people who didn't go, who weren't there, to listen to Andy and to, you know, Think about what, how we run this. You know, we, we ran the war by letting the volunteer army do it. I call them in the book the other 1%. Um, and everyone else kind of forgot about the wars and just went on with their lives. Um, and uh, I heard after the book appeared from the, the two, uh, the, the, the minister and the um, uh, psychologist who run this and that, that they had appreciated the book and they saw that the scene was in the book. It's in the, it's in the book twice, actually. Um, 
And then I asked, you know, how's Andy? And uh, they said he's doing really well. And he's helping Afghan refugees uh, here in this country. Um, and I thought that was not unrelated to the fact that they did that. Right? So maybe that's a note to end on. Thank you.